There's no one size fit all to help every single person in this group. We are just humans who happen to be disabled and in this case happen to love video games. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Live Proud podcast. This is the first episode in 2021 and I'm super, super excited. We had a great journey in 2020 and for 2021, we are continuing on with some great conversations as well as highlighting some amazing communities within the gaming space. And today I have two amazing guests who are gonna be diving more into conversations surrounding uh, the disabled gamers community. Uh, we have Steve Spawn. Steve is the COO of Able Gamers Charity, an award-winning content creator and internationally recognized advocate for people with disabilities, featured on platforms like CNN, NBC, and other major news outlets. Cherry Thompson. Cherry Thompson is shaping the future of games through their ongoing work to make games accessible and to create more inclusive spaces in the industry for disability, mental health, and LGBTQIA plus developers in their role, especially as accessibility project manager at Ubisoft. Cherry, Steve, it's so great to have you guys here today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, I would love for you two to dive a little bit more within your backgrounds and, and what you two have been doing in terms of your your initiatives towards accessibility, towards uh, supporting and amplifying this community. I would love to start with Steve and then Cherry after. My name is Steve and I have uh, a Twitch channel where I like to play with a hat on my head and a mouse in my hands. I have a disability called SMA, Spinal Muscular Atrophy. It is a terminal disability where eventually my muscles will weaken to the point that I just don't breathe anymore. And I decided a long time ago that if that was going to be my end, that the middle part was going to be trying to make the world a better place. And sometimes that involves making people not happy with me. Sometimes that involves making people really happy with me. But at the end of the day, just out there trying to do something. And part of doing something was joining up with Able Gamers, which is a 501c3 nonprofit charity that's creating opportunities to enable play in order to combat social isolation, foster inclusive communities, and improve the quality of life for people with disabilities, which is a giant bunch of fancy lawyer speak for we do our best to help the players with disabilities out there be able to find ways either by giving them the technology they need to play games, working with developers like Ubisoft to develop their games as accessible as possible, and working with devs themselves to become the best devs that they can to help design for people with disabilities. It's always fun following Steve. <laughs> 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 We've been here many times, Steve. So I've been doing this quite a while. Before video games, I worked in film and the comics industry until my disabilities meant I couldn't work in those industries anymore because they're very physical jobs. And in 2013, I had a stroke, which was as a result of the main genetic condition that I live with. And it's the kind of complications that you get with my disabilities. Um, I'm also autistic and have ADHD, which uh, is an interesting combo along with physical disabilities. And so around that time, I started really struggling for the first time where I could no longer play games at all. Whereas before it was always like games were very painful or like extraordinarily difficult or I just it took me a lot more practice to be good at a game than most people this kind of thing that was kind of when I realized that it was something I kind of wanted to really put a lot of energy into because I suddenly had a lot of more energy from having to give up my previous career and I moved into advocacy and that mostly started online like it does for a lot of people. Um, I streamed for a few years, I've, uh, I did YouTube, I've done so much content creation over the years. And eventually I saw a niche where there were not many advocates moving into games development from um, having starting with a disability and moving into the industry for many reasons. There's so many reasons that happens, which we'll get into, I'm sure. But for me, I had the opportunity um, to learn game design and uh, further my knowledge and, and this kind of thing. And I worked as a freelance consultant on game design and accessibility for a few years. And then I joined Ubisoft 
during the pandemic. At the very beginning of the pandemic, I was meant to move March 30th last year, and I'm still in Vancouver and not Montreal. So now I work for Ubisoft as the Accessibility Project Manager. Well, you, you, both of you have an amazing background and story, and that story has contributed to the amplification of said community that we're going to be discussing a lot more today. Now, for those who are tuning in who may not fully be aware of the community in, in various different capacities, I would love for you to to discuss, you know, what in terms of the disabled gamers community, who does it all encompass? Um, I would love Cherry to start with you and, and then Steve follow after. My my take is that it encompasses anybody and everybody. Disability can affect anybody. It, you don't have to consider yourself disabled, in air quotes, to belong to the disabled players community or gamers community. And for me, disability isn't just what we classically label as disability or the doctors label as disability or bureaucrats or any of those people. It's do you experience barriers to playing games, whether that means you can't play some games at all, or even if it's milder things like frustration, um, where there shouldn't be frustration, pain, where there shouldn't be pain. If that's you, or if you believe in helping more people play games and being part of this community, then you belong. And for me, that's who exists in that all-encompassing bubble. Yeah, you know, not sure I could have said that any better. We are a community. And sometimes I think that gets a little bit lost because we're also this, you know, kind of special interest group, as the IDGA calls us. We are just a bunch of people. And not all of us get along. We all have different issues. We all have different challenges. We all have different agendas. We all are people. And there's there's no one size fit all to help every single person in this group of disabled people. We are just humans who happen to be disabled and in this case happen to love video games. You know, there are 42 million potential players with disabilities, according to Able Gamers, in America alone, 7 million in Canada, and the number just continues to climb from there as you add more countries around the world. That's a lot of people. And, you know, there is no, there is no way of labeling encompassing everyone rather than just saying we're just people and we just happen to be disabled and that is as far as that goes. I, I love the way that you 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 two mentioned that is the community is is the people who are within it, the people who support it, and it definitely provides a bigger uh, scope and view of the community that maybe some people never even thought about before. And and so I I appreciate you guys breaking that down a lot more for us. And both of your answers, you mentioned some of the challenges and and. And obstacles, you know, for example, playing games and, and, you know, having that challenge of being in pain when you're playing games or, um, you know, maybe it's the visual component, the audio component that there's some obstacles within it. So what are some of the barriers and some of the exclusion barriers that the community is currently facing when it comes to video games or just gaming in general? Yeah, so many, so many. I mean, it depends where you even want to begin talking about it, because if we talk about the games themselves, there are so many different barriers in my work. I've generated reports that have 200 different issues on it. That's how many barriers there can be in a game. And that probably wasn't exhaustive because I sometimes will let things slide if in order to prioritize things that are more important. Then, you know, you can talk about the community and barriers to being part of the community and that exists in every facet of the community, whether that's working in the industry where, like I said, like there's good reasons why there are not many people that are either visibly disabled um, I don't like to say invisible, I like to say unseen, because if you know what you're looking for for disability, it's not really invisible. You can usually spot it, even if it's what's traditionally considered invisible. And so with working in the industry, you get um, barriers to entry, barriers to the education, um, whether that's financial or physical or, you know, many cognitive barriers. And then once you're in the industry, there's a lot of people that are disabled and aren't out about it because they don't necessarily feel confident or safe disclosing their disability if it's the kind of disability that they don't have to disclose and so gosh there's just so many we could talk for hours just on that one topic <laughs> it's the same in content creation too as I'm sure Steve would be able to tell you I mean as we both can honestly um, mm. 
you know, uh, in, in gaming in general for things specific to that particular area, you know, um, here's, here's the, the largest problem is that it's not only a lot of people, but the range of challenges moves like a goalpost constantly. Uh, let's take a good example. So Ubisoft recently put out um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. It is something that uh, had accessibility checks, had advocates checking it over, had people checking out the accessibility, and pretty much viewed as a you know at least accessible game. And I can't play it. Now I can play it well enough to do one stream of it, but the mouse sensitivity on it was. A to the point where I couldn't comfortably do it. And it hurt my arms physically to do it, and I had to hide that while streaming it because I told Ubisoft that I would do a stream of it, and I did. But, you know, what I always promise is also honest feedback. And so I told them, hey, it's just not comfortable, I can't play it, not quite fast enough. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it still remains that today. And that's because there are a million Steves out there, actually, 42 million in America. So we all have our own slight variation of what is accessible to you, right? So is that game accessible to me? Yes, I could say it's accessible. Is it accessible enough that I can play it for a long period of time? No. Is it something that I can tough it out and just play if I really want to with my friends? Yes, absolutely. And, and so you go back and forth with those little criteria changes of, you know, how accessible is it? Is it accessible enough? Are you willing to go through the pain to play it? Does it mean that much to you that you're willing to endure in order to go through it? And, and these are all things that not only do you have to go through, but then you have to communicate to a dev and get the dev to then communicate to their team to understand that it's a priority to fix. And sometimes they want to, and sometimes the publisher might say no. Sometimes there's red tape, like... There's a billion things, and again, like Cherry just said, we could literally talk about this for the entire podcast. It's just a measurement that's very hard in that the barriers pop up for different people at different times and different levels. I think you mentioned a really interesting barrier that you didn't actually say is a barrier in there that I know I've struggled with as a streamer in the past is do you let on that you're in pain? Like if you let on you're in pain and you're struggling with playing a game, it's not that you don't want to let that let on because you don't want, like, cause there's these rules about how you can't, like we don't ever say that we would really want people to be themselves when they play our games. But the consideration we have to make or that people have to make as streamers and content creators and trying to succeed in that industry, you can only be disabled to a point before people stop accepting you or stop, you know, coming to your streams or like you have to, prioritize like what people are there for and it's kind of like when you exist in a room right like you don't want to bring everyone down by constantly talking about how you're in pain it's same when you're on stream like so many of us exist with non-stop pain like I have not had a single day in my life where I haven't been in pain but most people around me don't know that unless I tell them and we don't want to tell them all the time for so many good reasons and those are the kind of barriers that I think are hard to talk about and that exclude people in ways that mean that we are not given the same opportunities to succeed or that we have to suffer in a way that other people don't. And it's why you don't see more successful streamers, for example, or esports players with disabilities, even though there are a few. It's because we have to deal with those kind of barriers as well. And I think those are important ones to bring light to. Yeah, and you, you, both of you touched on just the the challenges sometimes with having these kind of conversations with those, and especially with those who uh, don't understand or maybe are unaware, or you know they may not think of that pain factor immediately because it's an experience that they don't experience. So when you're having these type of conversations, how do you have it in a way that one helps them understand, and two is part of that educational process, right? Because there's an etiquette towards the usage of words to describe the community, to describe what's going on in a way that is inclusive and in a way that doesn't put down anyone. So how do you have that conversation of being firm and stern or being vocal and open, but then also educating that person in the usage of words and, the, and, and experiences as well? Well, you generally can tell people what words they should absolutely positively stay away from. And the, the trouble with language is that we all feel differently and strongly about different words and we all care about them to a different degree. 
So, for example, um, most of us, you know, don't like being called uh, something like uh, maybe a normal or something where you might say, you know, like Cherry said earlier, but some people don't like invisible disabilities. Some people kind of bristle against that. Um, there's lots of words that we can mention as, you know, don't say that, don't say the strong R word. We're almost all in agreement about that. And then as you move down the, the road, things become a little bit muddier where one person doesn't like this word, another person doesn't like this word. And so a great example is person first versus identity first. So, you know, I might say for me, I am a disabled gamer. But for other people, I try to say that they are players with disabilities because it's not up to me to decide if they want to label themselves in what way. I have to listen to what they want. And if I don't know them or if it's a general segment, I'll try to say just the most uh, innocuous term I possibly can. And it, it, it's difficult, quite honestly, as someone who has tried very hard to to put it out there and what people want, what they don't, you end up where you advocate for one group and the other group gets mad at you. Or you say one thing and then the other people are mad at you. And it's hard because then able-bodied people are like, well, we don't know what to do if you don't know what to do. It's like, well, okay, that's a point. But also here's the words you shouldn't say, so don't do this. And then it becomes a giant seven hour conversation about ableism. And yeah. Yeah. Um, part of my job is educating other developers on how to speak to people with disabilities and or speak about disability. And yeah, that's the thing is language is always evolving and changing. And just like any marginalized community, there are the words that are used to hurt us. And those are the words that you should know. And if you don't know them, then now is the time to learn them, right? Like you can go out there and you can Google and you can figure that out. Those are the things that I think that people should be educating themselves on. And then the gray area where it's kind of conflicted, where some people are okay with the world and some people aren't, or there's different preferences. And some people's preferences can be very strong one way or the other. And it's just, it's good to recognize that and know that. And what I try to educate people and what we try to say internally at Ubisoft is, ask, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions, F learn how to ask respectfully, learn how to not treat someone like a child, treat them like an equal, you know, like you would anyone else. And if you're not sure, always ask, how would you prefer we talk about your disabilities? How, like, is it okay to talk about your disabilities? How would you prefer we refer to you? And this opens up the conversation and it makes people feel safe and comfortable if you're even asking those questions, right? And I think that's true for any marginalized community where we all overlap because I'm always talking about intersectionality because if we don't talk about that, then we're going to exclude people, whether that's because of how we talk about disability or how we talk about race or religion or, you know, sexuality or gender. Like disability is unique and that encompass everyone. Anyone can be disabled, right? So... It's the same conversation, really. And we don't expect anyone to be perfect or to know everyone makes mistakes, everyone slips up. Like, my pronouns are they, them. That's a very new thing for most people. And some people get really worried if they slip up and don't use they, them. And as long as someone shows me that they're trying or that they ask, that's okay. You know, we're not perfect. So it's the same for dis uh, language about disability, too, I think. Yeah, you know, I always say, I always tell people, sincere questioning is better than assumptions. It's it's better for you to ask too many questions than to make assumptions. And even when you were saying about people are trying, you know, even for me, and I'm sure you two have caught earlier, I, I'm really trying not to say you guys anymore. I'm trying to say you all or you two, because it is important to show and also highlight and, and create a more inclusive environment to make people feel comfortable at the end of the day. And I really appreciate that everyone within the community and just people in general are trying to be more inclusive of everyone. And that's the beauty of gaming. Gaming is for everyone. And so anything that we can do to create conversations to make it more inclusive for everyone is going to be better overall long term and just even short term as well. And you know, with with your with the community itself, uh, there are misconceptions that even with the answers that you guys have brought, excuse me, you two have brought up. With those answers, it's really has highlighted some misconceptions I feel that others may have in terms of this community. And typically, when it comes to the overall gaming world, what are some of the common misconceptions that you would hope that people would? rephrase or refocus on or 
think differently that it's it's not quite like this when it comes to community. It's actually like this. What are some of those misconceptions? I'm the most glaringly obvious one that people like me and Cherry are out there with swords attempting to take their guns and their games away. It's not it's not a thing. We're not trying to come for anyone. We're not attacking anyone. We are literally trying to advocate for a whole bunch of people that for a long, long time didn't have a voice. And that that is something that, that all advocates are trying to do is, you know, there is a lack of representation and, and we're out there trying to do our best to to be that representation. And sometimes you miss up. Sometimes you go the wrong way. Sometimes you push the wrong person and you, you think you're amplifying, but really you're you're just kind of pushing someone who was really loud and, you know, and most of the community doesn't feel that way. And so you try your best. And, and the problem is that people think that at that point you're just attacking. And th I'm sure there are some people out there who uh, take things very, very passionately and, and and whatnot, but as far as most of us, most advocates are not trying to get anyone in trouble, you know? There was a big misconception and problem we had with developers long before Cherry was ever at the point of going to work for Ubisoft was just getting them to realize that we weren't the cops and they weren't the robbers. This was something that I personally heard from developers repeatedly was, you know, well, we don't want you policing our games. And I'm like, I'm not trying to police your game. I'm trying to tell you that here's some more money if you go over here and you can probably get people to play your game. And so just the misconception that people think that advocates are trying to make their games too easy or adding in modes is a horrible thing or options. And, you know, it's like just understand that people are just trying to do their best to make this inclusive and welcoming for everyone. I think the difficulty with misconceptions is misconceptions are a symptom, right? They're not the cause. For me, for me, misconceptions are a symptom that a conversation hasn't happened or that a conversation isn't happening. And I think there's everyone deals with misconceptions. Developers deal with misconceptions. There are many misconceptions about why a game may be not accessible in a particular way or, or it might be. We face many, many difficulties and barriers and um, things that, you know, we don't talk about because we like there to be some magic about how games are made and we we like there to you know the miss the more mystery there is about how our games are made the more enjoyable they are the more someone knows about what's under the hood unlike if they were you know really into cars or even if maybe if they're into game design they'd be they'd be really interested but for the majority of players the magic is is what makes a game and so i think that misconceptions on in any field or in in any community is because there hasn't been a equal respectful conversation back and forth about the crux of the issue like we have a lot of misconceptions around difficulty and they're different mix there's like lots of related but different misconceptions in gaming and they can be there's like it's like a messy big bubble of a spectrum, like a word cloud, um, where you've got very angry gamers, and I'm going to be frank, toxic gamers sometimes who get a particular way. And then all through that spectrum, you have the typical player who doesn't necessarily quite understand what difficulty even is really. They know about difficulty modes, but as a game designer, for me, difficulty is a bit of a, a weird word in, because it's not a real thing. It's a magical thing that we make players feel. So it's a feeling. It's not an actual thing that we can go into a game engine and turn a knob and there you go, there's your difficulty, right? It's a really skillful amount of balancing and mathematics and um, lots of very technical things. And so it's, it's challenge, really. It's about how we challenge people and what that challenge is is very individual. And so those are the kind of um, misconceptions we deal with is is because we don't necessarily have that respectful conversation back and forth between people about why some person one person thinks one way and one one person the other. Now there's lots of reasons for that. Like any heated discussion is people are not necessarily good at it. Like we're all learning humans. We're all very we all get in fights with our spouses or our family or our friends. Um, so we're going to get in fights with strangers, you know, like it's, there's so many reasons that we're not good at communicating. But if we could all have more conversations, then maybe we'd have mess, less misconceptions for everybody. Yeah. And that's that's one of the problems is that those misconceptions are often communication that hasn't gone right. And then there are the outliers of people who are just willfully 
non-understanding because they don't want to. They have no interest in their game being changed. They are the toxic people. They are the ones that just want to get in there and, and be the the troll under the bridge. And those are the ones you have to watch out for because if you, especially if you go on Twitter and you try to have a, a good discourse about why something needs to change, you'll accidentally engage with one of them that really is not trying to understand your side or your point of view. They just want to get you into an argument. And, you know, that's why language is so important, although we just got done discussing how difficult <laughs> it is. It's also important, you know. The, the words that you use are the words you attach to the experience. So if I say, I want an easy mode, then people are thinking I'm asking for something to be super easy for me. I can just walk through it and be like, Bee! as I beat a game. And, you know, then some people get upset about that. And that's why we try really hard in different discourse. You know, you can see Cherry and I have done multiple articles on words and language. It's all about trying to make people understand that we, as a group, as a collective people, we're really looking for that way to make things as equal as possible and for those misconceptions to lead the conversations to lead to equality. Yeah, it's it's great, Steve, that you're mentioning words. I think that words really, it, it, there's sometimes different interpretation of words when it comes to unseen communities, right? I know, for example, and this has been happening often, I, I've seen on social media where if there's any topics or conversation around diversity, there's always this notion of like, unqualified expectations of like that the unseen communities receiving something right it's it's unfortunately there are these misconceptions that fuel some of these misinterpretations of the words and and the overall conversation and of course like you said it was it brings up the uh the toxic people which uh the mute button is beautiful for those kind of people you know i think that Overall conversations are happening, whether you whether it's happen, uh, happening on Twitter or whether it's happening within this podcast, these dispelling these misconceptions is going to help with driving the overall conversation of, of accessibility and driving that conversation will help with the initiatives that will assist those who would who would love to play certain games but need some technology assistance. And so what kind of technology are we seeing with companies that they are currently implementing or working on to to really increase accessibility within the gaming industry? Sure. <laughs> you don't want to take this one, Steve. I feel like Able Gamers is such a good, you have such a good background here, especially with like assistive technology and things. Um, <laughs> I mean, so I think at this point, most everyone has heard uh, Able Gamer's mantra of that there is a solution out there that can enable a lot of people to be able to play various different games, but there is no technological solution for everyone. There are a vast array of the misconceptions that people think that there, there is this, like, you pull up the Walmart and be like, oh, I'll take accessibility for $50, please, thank you. And you put it in the cart and you take it home, and that's not how that works. Everybody has their own set of challenges, just like everybody listening uh, has their own set of things that they deal with every day. So there's all kinds of cool technologies. There's things that you can play with your eyes, with your mouth, with your head, with your feet. There are people that I know who literally play with just a few toes, and they're not bad at the games that they like to choose to play, you know? And now... A different separate conversation is what are those games because what you can play and what technology works for you is often very different than you'd like to play. Uh, that's entirely different, entire seven hour talk. But as far as technology, the things that are out there that are cool will allow you to use almost any part of who you are to play games. So there's even the game where you can just yell at, those, at the game, yell until yell or you blow up or something like that. One of the game out there where you just yell nonsense into your microphone, and that's how you stop it from blowing up. But you can also use that same vocal cords to talk into a dictation program, like I do to type, or use a mouth controller to play games. Or, you know, even on a specialized hat, like people saw me running around the internet talking about winning Fall Guys, you know. Or, I mean, even the, sh the technology that uh, Cherry has used to keep her streams going. But, so there's like the physical technology, like the adaptive technology that the like controllers and things like this, or anything that's anything that's used in assistive technology or adaptive technology anywhere, whether to, to access software or operation systems or computers in general can be used for gaming. So there's just so much, but there's the technology that exists in how we build our games too, and how games are being made and communication systems. And 
I think that that is going to be constantly evolving and changing. And we have a lot of constraints, just like with any technology. One of the misconceptions is that when we make games, we make a new game from scratch every time. That's really not how games are made. Um, when we make a game, uh, we are most often building on top of systems that have existed for a long time and bring in all these different systems together to make them work. And it's almost like making a quilt. Why have I never thought of that before? Anyway, <laughs> it's kind of like making a quilt and you're adding to your, like your family's quilt and you have to deal with aunt so-and-so's dodgy stitching and like <laughs> the stitching that is kind of outdated now and it was cool back in the 70s or whatever. This is this analogy is going nowhere. But um, I think the kinds of technologies we see are ideally a beautiful balance of what's needed versus what we can do. And so I think this is why it's so important to get the accessibility of games themselves right. Like as I went down a path there, but as Steve was saying that, you know, you can't just roll up to Walmart and say, hey, I'll have an adaptive controller and I'm good to go. In fact, even the Xbox adaptive controller, you have to have a certain amount of knowledge and understanding to, in order to be able to utilize it for, especially for more profound disabilities. And so that's not accessible in the way that a lot of people misuse that word. It's not approachable, right? It's not available. It's not easy to use. It's it's a barrier in itself. And so really the beauty is in how accessible can we make our games? Because that means we're making them more accessible to people that don't have to ha like earn their degree in how to make the, their environment or their, their interaction accessible to begin with. I think we'll always need both, but I feel like the future should move towards where people need that adaptive and assistive technology less and less and games, consoles, the operating systems, they will all become much more accessible. And I think both Sony and Xbox, as a good example, have done really wonderful with their new consoles. Now, of course, it's not perfect. Like nothing's perfect. Everything's iterative in, in games and we're always building and we're always improving. And sometimes we have to take small steps. But I think that given where the old consoles were and the new features on the new consoles, I'm very happy to see that progress. Now, sometimes the stumbling blocks in that progress as well, like you've mentioned with the sensitivity in Assassin's Creed or in on the PlayStation 5, some of the things that were implemented to be more immersive for the typical player might be a barrier for players with disabilities. And so it's really always about making sure that we are correcting our biases and understanding who we're making these things for and really get to know and understand everyone's experience. Because if we don't know, that's where we make mistakes. That's where technology should go. <laughs> and, and this is a follow-up question that I'm actually curious about. I know you both have touched on that there are different obstacles and challenges when it comes to accessibility for games, whether it's from a technology standpoint or even gameplay standpoint. There, of course, there's varying different levels, but is there a specific genre, a game genre that tends to be have more of those obstacles and challenges versus other genres within within the gaming world? I think any genre that is made to be ultra challenging, that would be ultra hard games. Um, they are some of my favorite games. They're some of the least accessible games just from the very nature of their design. But I do think that's changing. I think it's slow, but I think it's changing. I think that designers as we make these games we start to understand oh you know what challenge really is what that means for different people and how we can still make an ultra challenging game and make it for more people and how that works and how we create recreate that experience of challenge and accomplishment which is really what we're trying to do and so I think we're getting there and I think just because of the nature of challenge that's why that's been the most traditionally inaccessible genre. Um, I think there's a bit of, again, a misconception that the reason that that genre is so inaccessible is because those designers don't care or don't, you know, want to uh, work on accessibility. But I don't think it's that. It's just, it's a harder problem to solve. And the harder the problem is to solve, the longer it takes to solve and the more behind everything else it's going to feel. I've got to tell you, as a designer, it's I love it. I just, it's one of my favorite things to work on is how do we make something difficult for someone that has limits and in a way that doesn't make them feel it's their limits that's stopping them. It should be a similar stopping point to someone that doesn't have those limits or those that experience. 
Yeah, you know, when Enable Gamer's um, Accessible Player Experiences program, we actually have a certificate that developers can come take a class with us, and we teach how you design with accessibility in mind. And in 2020, despite the pandemic, we put out 113 developers into the world who now have a better understanding of accessibility than they did previously. And one of the cornerstones of the APX program is that we aren't the developers. Cherry is a designer. I am not a designer. I'm not a developer. I have a little bit of coding in HTML5 and that's what I know, which means I can like open up a notepad and make it an HTML document and then stare at it and Google how to do anything else. That's, that's literally all I have. And, you know, they're the experts and they, and they need to continue being the experts. What we can do is we can provide a list of challenges, a way to deal with those, a way to think, a way to reframe your mindset so that you view the problem as a fun challenge and not an obstacle that needs to be defeated. So one of the great things about the genres out there is that they're super difficult for you depending on what your disability is just the same as anyone else may have a similar thought about man i don't like racing games because they're super quick reflexes and i don't i always steer my car into the wall or maybe i don't like platformers because man jumping right over that axe at the right time is really hard for me you know but maybe you're really good at puzzles maybe you're really good at social commentary games like among us where you're just running around and murdering your friends for fun you know uh, you know, there, there's lots of different ways to play out there. And I think that, well, as we mentioned earlier, that your disability will influence uh, what kind of games you can play. You'll still try to find ways around it as best you can. I mean, disabled people, quite honestly, are the most ingenuitive bunch on the planet. We start out from zero learning that the world wasn't made for us so we're gonna have to make it work for us and and you just you figure it out for yourself and sometimes you can teach some other people along the way how to do that but as far as genres of games i think it really i know it sounds like a cop-out answer but it really is up to the individual i think cherry is correct in that the games that are supposed to be hard are right now what i would also label as the most quote-unquote inaccessible but i do think that what people consider challenging is changing Especially, as I just mentioned, Among Us. I know people who love Dark Souls, but they won't touch Among Us because they don't want to lie to their friends. And it gives them anxiety and they don't like it. So what, what it is that's a challenge to you and fun to get around changes, especially as the world changes. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I don't touch Dark Souls because I get upset by dying constantly, constantly, constantly. And that's part of the game. That's part of the progression of it. And there's some games where it's like you have, in order to win, you have to lose a lot. And I don't like losing. Um, <laughs> so I avoid it. So I, I completely understand, you know, from that perspective. But I, I would say the one thing that no one can really uh, run past sometimes is the cost when it comes to accessibility. And so what are some of the financial implications when it comes to, accessibility from a technology standpoint like how how does one or how does the how does the gaming industry how can we address these costs you know because the barrier to entry in some capacities is not as low as people think yeah i think it's a tough one i think this is why for me it's so important to get our games as accessible as possible because if our games are as accessible as possible then people are less likely need to need a special controller or like extra plugins or to be able to use a controller from a different console in which case you need to buy a special adapter like i can mostly use a ps4 controller which is very different to most people most people find Xbox controller is more comfortable and more intuitive. And so sometimes that requires an adapter to play it, uh, use it on something else. And so like, I think if we can do anything we can, like I get uh, in my education and the way I work with other developers as a specialist is I get a lot of questions about like, well, what technology do other, like do people with disabilities use? And I, I tell them and I, we go through it and we talk about it, but I also talk to them about, you know, this doesn't actually change your job. Xbox adaptive controller existing doesn't change your job. It doesn't change what we have to do. It doesn't change what we need in a game. We still need control remapping in the game. We still need 
not just button swapping, but exhaustive control remapping, which is something the industry is inching its its way toward, where people can reduce the number of buttons they use have to use and things like this. Something that I think that is underestimated is the financial accessibility of accessibility is socioeconomic barriers are a real barrier that are bigger for, and more profound for disabled people in general. Like disabled people are much more underemployed than any other underrepresented group. Most people have a limited income. And so if you buy a game and it's not accessible, and then in North America, you can't actually return that game, then you're out 60 or $80, whether you're, you know, depending which country you're in. Those are the kind of things that I think people don't realize is what that means for players in their day to day. There's just so many things that need to change. And unfortunately, we can't change them all, but we can all do our own little part from our own little corner. And um, at least at Ubisoft, what we're trying to do is make things as accessible as possible through the entire company. So as um, my team like to say, is the DNA of the company um, is changing that so that our media events are more accessible, so that um, people can know ahead of when they're buying a game what that game might have in it that might help them. We can't tell anyone, what any one person, this game will be accessible for you. We should never do that. It's up to the person because we'll never be able to tell until they try it and decide for themselves. And so we just provide as much information as we can in an accessible way as we can and include people in the hype too, because like that's super important, but it's very underestimated. Yeah. So we were lucky, Jerry and I, we got in on the accessible controller from Xbox very, very early. My fellow Able Gamers uh, co-worker Craig Kaufman and myself got called into a meeting before the legal department at Xbox even agreed to show this controller off. And they had to actually draw it on a notepad to show us this dark controller because legal hadn't approved us seeing it yet. That's how early we were in on it. It was fantastic. But it got unveiled in this way that people thought that it was either A, a miracle controller that every disabled person on the planet could suddenly be able to play games, or B, that the controller was somehow different. It's not. And one of the things Cherry touched on there that I really wanted to focus on here is heads of studios or at least creative directors were reaching out to you going can i borrow your xac because we can't get a hold of one yet can we borrow yours real quick and you're going no it's no different it's just a controller it's just our way of using the same xbox controller does the x button work on your controller it works on the xac too that's that is, is it, it's just a more expensive controller it's a 99 dollar controller so if a disabled person who may be struggling between choosing between food and rent now has to go get the $99 controller instead of the $40 controller, those are the financial implications on this. They're, they're the things the studio really needs to keep in mind is that you're just battling against two problems at the same time. And they're all honestly two different sides of the same coin, which makes it frustrating. A, you have people with disabilities who have very strapped, very limited incomes due to the way our government in America does SSI. Uh, you, you may not have money to spend on things like video games. At the same time, according to Able Gamers' own estimates, there's $2.2 billion worth of disabled spending power in the world. So we as a group have a lot of ability, and that's why developers need to pay attention to us because of that spending power uh, and because that we do have the chance to spend our money and buy games it's just things are expensive so we have to be more choosy about where that money goes so it's this weird <laughs> confluence of both explaining to everyone hey we have a limited budget but also we do have some budget so you should probably you know put in some accessibility up so we want to buy your game too and this pandemic has definitely spotlighted some of these pain points that are within the industry, especially when it comes to the overall conversation of accessibility. And so um, from from what you two have noticed, you know, what are some of those areas that have been highlighted and spotlighted a lot more because of the current pandemic situation we're in? It's been a difficult ride for everyone, right? Like, I think that's important to acknowledge first is that it's not easy for anyone. I think for me, though, what was difficult at first was as a disabled player now, not speaking professionally, but as just someone who 
has felt the exclusion, for example, from Pokemon Go, um, which was a really hard thing for me as a big Pokemon fan since I was 18. I often talk about my history and how Pokemon, I was homeless as a teenager and Pokemon got me through that time when Pokemon, uh, the very first Pokemon first came out because I'm old. Um, <laughs> but um, it was a very, very special um franchise to me. And so being excluded from that because I cannot walk like a typical person, I mostly use a wheelchair or I use crutches. And so I cannot walk and use my phone at the same time. I can't even use my wheelchair and use my phone at the same time because I use a manual wheelchair. And crutches obviously take two hands. And I basically have no hands when I'm walking. That's why I tell people. And so seeing features in games that we needed a long time ago to be included now become available because everyone's stuck at home when we've been stuck at home for many, many years is a very difficult thing for the community to go through. And I think we've all been feeling that at the same time, it's like, welcome to our world. Oh, you're here. And now everyone gets the stuff. Cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. The work from home thing. I mean, oh man, I would bet you a, a serious chunk of my bank account that if you went back in time to Cherry's Twitter and to my Twitter, you would see both of us complaining and railing at anyone who would listen. The man companies really need to let us work from home. And, uh, you know, suddenly now that the pandemic came out, all those companies that said, yeah, it's just not possible. I know y'all are disabled, but yeah, oh, we just can't, we can't make it remote. So now suddenly they're like, you know what? Working at home actually makes you more productive. This is great. You guys should keep doing it. And it's like, huh, okay, well, why has it suddenly changed? And you know, it's just, again, working with the world, you know, making it, uh, trying to make it work for you, even if you're disabled. There's a scary side of it, too, because a lot of us in the disability community have now seen that work from home is possible if the company wants it to be. And that, you know, maybe you can see a movie in your home instead of having to go to a theater where getting up in your wheelchair might be super painful to do that. Well, when the pandemic's over, does that end? Or is everything going to, quote unquote, go back to the way it was? And so you're starting to see, at least I am, on my Twitter feed, on my Facebook, I'm starting to see disabled people who are voicing fear that some of these things that magically went away when the world was in a pandemic scare that got better in an odd way for people with disabilities are going to go back away. And most of us kind of just hope the world learns some lessons along the way. Yeah, I think it's one of those chicken and an egg situations, right, as well, because until the tools existed to enable big teams to work from home in a more effective way and a more fluid way and that they were stable enough for like large, large companies to do so, it was really hard for those companies to really even test it out, let alone know if it would work for them. So it's just easier to maintain the status quo and say, you know, we can't do that. I do have a certain amount of sympathy in that like, Sometimes it takes a big thing to show you a different way or to, for the technology to advance. I have a friend I was talking to last year, a mentor in the industry, and she was saying she was so excited and happy that like teleconferencing had jumped ahead 20 years. And that's a weird feeling to have when it's also a pandemic and people are very sick. And so I do want to recognize that as frustrating and difficult as it's been for me that I do have some understanding for why but I do also share those fears as, as to will we get to keep this yeah and um, I have a quick question before I, I ask you guys the last question as a follow-up to to what was just discussed now that we're at this point you know and the hope is that companies will continue to these uh, changes and adjustments that they've made during the pandemic and to keep that so that it's more inclusive for everyone how can we productively reshape some of these biases and how do we productively reshape the views of, of companies and individuals and in saying, hey, what you thought was impossible for, clearly this pandemic has made it, sh like shown that it is possible. So how do we productively take that viewpoint and that conversation and continue it forward so that those who are within the disabled community can be included moving forward? I think you need to remember a couple of points. From my my view, I can say remain civil. It has never in my experience in working with the industry worked for me to scream curse words and make demands of an industry. It's better to try to figure out how to work with them and make them understand, you know, the bottom line of 
we can be more productive if we stay at home. This is what I need. If you give me what I need as a disabled person, then I'm more likely to do what you need me to do. I, I can be a productive member of your team if you give me these tools that I need to do it. The problem is sometimes for some of us, it feels a bit like begging for necessities and, and, and basics. And, and that kind of gets into a little muddy gross area. Um, which is a much longer conversation. But to shorten it, the best I can say is that we have to continue to show these companies the reasons why they should do what we're asking them to do, not only ask them to do it. That was something I made a mistake in my early career was I would tell them that they should do something, not necessarily why they should do it other than, well, yeah, be a good person. If, uh, you know, if you show the case models, if you show the reasoning, you can reach more people. And so I think my quick advice on that subject would be if you're going to argue towards a company to keep something that worked during anything, a pandemic or a crisis or even just a happenstance where somebody found something works, just show them why it worked and they're more likely to work on keeping it with you. Yeah, I think building on that, I think, Steve, you make a great point as be professional, right? As difficult as it can be, because it's also personal. Sure, it's video games, it's fun. It's a professional industry. Industry. We're a bunch of professionals. All of us right here are professionals. No matter what part of the industry you work in, you are a professional in that, indus in that part of the industry. And even as a fan or a player, be professional towards the professionals of the industry. And I do agree, it's, diff it's very difficult. I came from a very, very emotional place of years of being excluded and seeing my friends excluded and fighting for people that didn't have a voice or didn't feel strong enough to have a voice, which sometimes we have to do. And it can be very difficult to balance that feeling with remembering that everyone's a person. Like we talk about a company or convincing the companies or like, how do we get companies to do this? Companies are people. What are companies? Let's break them down. They're people, processes, bureaucracy. Like that's a company. But what I want to always um, especially extend to fellow developers and things like that, and also give a shout out to all my colleagues at Ubisoft that are champions and care so much for making things accessible and, and furthering the, the movement of accessibility, whether that's from a design and development perspective, or even all the way through to our amazing PR department and people working behind the scenes to educate our developers. We have like a lot of internal education programs, for example, there's so many different initiatives that people are coming to the accessibility team that I'm on and asking us, how do we help you with this? What can we do? What do we, what can we do for you? And we're like, oh my gosh, really? Like all this stuff that we don't have time for that we know we need to do. Can you please help us with this? And people are doing it. And that's the amazing thing. And that's what I want people to remember. It starts with a conversation. We have a conversation that breaks down the biases and the stigma and the misconceptions that we've been talking about the whole hour and action is the next step and people make action not companies not I mean because I mean people are companies but not the companies and you know it's not a magical company you have to convince it's people and everyone has their own struggles as well and remembering that we're all in a pandemic as well we're all at home, like many of my colleagues are homeschooling their children and things like this while they're trying to make games. And I tell you, making games is exhausting and so hard and advocacy is hard. And I want to recognize that, like, even if you're a developer, if you're a player, if you're a content creator, no matter what area you work in, if you are trying to change something and, and bring progress to the industry, you are an advocate it's hard, make sure you have support, make sure there are people around you, make sure that you can take care of yourself. And that goes back to the mute button is one of the, the most key skills of an advocate is learning to spot the people that are your accomplices and not the people that just want to tear you down and learning to work with that. Yeah, and active listening is such an important skill set as well to have, to have, whether it's actively listening to yourself and your needs, actively listening to others. You know, it's so important because everyone goes through different things. They have different struggles, obstacles, challenges. But at the end of the day, you know, I think it's important that for everyone that's listening, you know, the important thing is to listen 
to listen and to take action. You may not fully understand and that's okay because that's not your experience. Everyone has different experiences, but as long as you're willing to actively listen and help take initiative and help act in whatever way you can, I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day. And I'm really excited to see how we progress, especially when it comes to accessibility and gaming. And so for for you two, uh, you've been around to see the progression of gaming, to see some of the changes, whether it's working in a company, working for a nonprofit, working within the industry as a whole. It's kind of like a two-part question in one. Where do you hope to see the gaming industry change when it comes to accessibility five, 10 years from now? And whatever that looks like, what does true accessibility in gaming look like five, 10 years, multiple years down the line? I think for me, this is a really great question. We always get asked this. And if you'd asked me five years ago where I wanted to see it, I would never have guessed we would be here where we are today. So for me, it always feels like a guess. And I know 100% without a doubt, I will be wrong. I will underestimate what we can do. I will underestimate what the industry can do and where we will get to every time. Even in the last year, just the number, like we're, we're expanding my team and we're hiring right now. The number of quality applicants we have versus when I was hired a year ago is mind blowing. Like I want to say congratulations to the community because holy banana sandwiches, I'm trying not to swear. People have learned, like people have learned so much in the last year in terms of accessibility and game design and, you know, what it takes to do this work. And so in five years, I don't even know, but I can tell you what I think true accessibility looks like. And that is, for me, I like to acknowledge that I don't actually, this is controversial sometimes, but I don't actually believe that every single game can be fully accessible to every single person, unfortunately. It's the nature of a video game. It has to have barriers. That's what makes a game a game. We have to be deliberate in what barriers we're put in there. We have to be conscious of who we're excluding. And if we can reduce the barriers that unnecessarily exclude people, we should 100%. But for me, so me, for me, true accessibility is that we are at a point in the industry where enough is accessible and in the right way that people get to choose what game they play, just like any non-disabled person. They get to choose it because it's their genre or they just don't like that kind of game. They don't like puzzle games. They don't like platforming games. And they get to choose it because they like it and they get to play and it gets to be as pain-free and as uh, as challenging as it should be, as, in it, as it's meant to be. Um, and that for me is true accessibility is when people get to make choices for the same reasons that any non-disabled person would get to make them. Same for events or any other aspect that we should be included in. Stanley said, the person who helps others simply because it should or must be done and because it is the right thing to do is indeed, without a doubt, a real superhero. And I have carried that mantra forward with me in everything that I've done, but in particular when it comes to accessibility. The advocates that are out there, whether they're listening or not, whether they're reading an audio transcript, whether there are gamers out there who never want to get into game devs or the game devs themselves who are listening, you're doing the right thing if you're trying to make the game more accessible. And you make the game as accessible as it can possibly be if you're a developer. If you're a gamer, you help them by submitting the bug reports, even though they're annoying to type. None of us like to submit bug reports. Do it anyway. If you have a game that you really want to fix, go find its proper channel and submit it to the game accessibility department of that company. Or if they don't, just tweet at them. Somebody's reading those Twitters. And if all else fails, reach out to Able Gamers and say, hey, this game is not super accessible. Could you poke them? And every once in a while, we'll try. It's hard because there's a lot of accessibility that still needs to come about. However, as we have said for a long time at Able Gamers, we want to be the only charity in the world that was ever put out of business. We wanted the world to get to the point that games were accessible. Yay, we did it. Throw the banner on the aircraft carrier. It's been done. But that is an idealistic world. And true accessibility just means that a product is as accessible as it can be for your situation. Let's just throw back really quickly to the Valhalla I mentioned earlier. 
if Ubisoft were to add in level 10 or 11 accessibility mouse speed, I probably could play it more. But at that rate, it still takes a lot of buttons to play that game. And in order to hit buttons, I have to throw my head around like I'm trying to whip my hair back and forth. And it, it takes it out of me. It takes it out of my muscles and it makes me tired. So even if they make it, like they bring me into it and they're like, Steve, guess what? This next Assassin's Creed, we're making it only for you. It's going to be amazing $50 billion put into this game and this is going to be for you. There would still be a limit to how much I could enjoy and play that game without completely wrecking all of it down to, can you just make everything happen with one button? That'd be great, thanks. Uh, you know, because my disability has its own set of challenges. And so sometimes, particularly players, but sometimes advocates get mad when you say something to the effect of, you know, this is as accessible as it is or as it can be. And, you know, you have to be conscious of that. Um, I don't defend developers who purposely leave out accessibility on purpose. Those people I will always yell at if they just don't think it's worth it or if disabled people aren't valuable as a community, I will always fight them. But the ones who are really trying and really trying to make their games as accessible as possible, like you have to understand they're, they're doing what they can, you know. And true accessibility is can you play the game? If you can and your friends can play, then that is accessible and understand that it's not a binary on and off thing. Accessibility is not a yes or no, it's not a checklist. It is a mindset of, are people able to play this and enjoy this? And can we do anything better to make it more accessible? And hopefully we'll get to that point where we have that true accessibility and improved accessibility throughout the gaming industry as a whole. And Cherry, Steve, this conversation was very informative and I definitely learned a lot more. And I'm sure a lot of the viewers are going to learn so much from listening to you too. And if they would like to learn more about your individual work, as well as what both Able Gamers and Ubisoft are doing in terms of accessibility, where can they find you two on social media or where can they find more information on the projects, the initiatives and the overall goals of, of both companies? Yeah, so I can be found at Cherry Ray, uh, Cherry like the fruit and R-A-E pretty much anywhere, um, but mostly Twitter these days. And for Ubisoft, if you go to Ubisoft.com and you go to our blog and you search accessibility, you'll find a great initiative that has been happening where every new release we talk about what we think will address barriers and include more people in playing that particular game. And it's a big rundown of, of not just the settings, but also um, how the gameplay looks and the progression and things like that. And also there you'll see all sorts of initiatives for things like audio described trailers. So pretty much everything can be found there. Our Twitter accounts in various countries also um, will tweet about accessibility initiatives and things as they happen. But um, yeah, follow me on Twitter. And my manager, David Tisserand, who is Tisserand at Tisserand David, who also tweets a lot about accessibility at Ubisoft. And you can find me on Twitter. My name's Steven Spawn, S-P-O-H-N. I have a fun uh, moniker of Steven Spawn. I know, super confusing, S-P-A-W-N on Twitch. Uh, you can come watch me badly play video games anytime you want, Wednesday through Sunday. I am often seen around the internet uh, running around with you know Ryan Reynolds or The Rock or whatever, doing those cool videos. If you see one, you know, and you, and you like the message behind it, even if you're sick of seeing my face, give it a retweet and uh, hopefully the message will get out there that players with disabilities exist. And, you know, Able Gamers, you can find everywhere under Able Gamers. We're a charity that is out there to help players with disabilities. We're just the custodians of donations. Really, that's all Able Gamers is, is people give us money to help players. And that's what we do it. Uh, we like to think we're one of the most transparent charities in the industry. And... I'd say the most important thing for anyone listening, for looking for people with disabilities, a content creator, is a follow on Twitter. Look, look out for everybody. You know, Cherry and I may be two of the quote unquote most famous, uh, but there's a lot of people out there. And, you know, we're all changing the industry. You know, it's the starfish example, right? So if you're on a beach and you see a starfish on the sand and you pick it up and you throw it into the water, you haven't changed the world, but you've changed the world for that starfish. 
So remember that when you're following a disabled content creator or a disabled advocate, remember that you can search them with hashtags like disabled gaming and you can find them on Twitter and hopefully Twitch will implement a damn tag one of these days. You can find us out there and look and find people that you resonate and follow them. Yeah, I think that's really important. That's how we avoid misconceptions and how we avoid those mistakes in language and things like that is if you don't have disabled people in your lives, follow them on the internet and learn from them and make sure you follow more than one because none of us are a monolith. Like I can talk to my experiences, Steve can talk to his, I can talk to the language I prefer. And, you know, we can, we can talk on behalf of the community, but it's not fair for us to be the voices. We need as many voices as possible to be heard and uplifted. And it's one of the reasons I stepped down from content creating, creation because I'm old and tired and it's time for new people. <laughs> Well, thank you, too, for just all the information. And I'm hoping that this conversation will encourage more people to to follow those within the community as well as continue following the work from from the two of you. And uh, I, I honestly really appreciate this wholeheartedly. And hopefully, you know, I can find ways along with Evil Geniuses and, and other companies I work with to, to help with that accessibility initiative. So definitely would love to stay in touch with you too. And for those who are tuning in, I hope you enjoyed this conversation and you strive in whatever way, whether big or small, to make this world a better place for everyone. And, you know, it doesn't matter how many big followers you have, how many small content creator, dev or not, there's always something in, that you can do to help others at the end of the day. And I hope you all enjoyed this. We We'll have more episodes from the Live Proud podcast powered by Evil Geniuses. My name is Aaron Ashley Simon. We will all catch you later on. Thank you all for tuning in.